shoot that it almost gets everything it's pretty close we are picking up act three scene one um, in the middle of Hamlet's conversation with Ophelia after the to be or not to be speech. I want to back up just a little bit from where we left off. <clears throat> we left off, I believe, um, right around line 117 or so. I want to back up to 115. Ophelia tells Hamlet 114, Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. When Hamlet says, I did love you once. Hamlet, you should not have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. You've got a gloss down there at the bottom. Inoculate, graft, metaphorical. And what he means by that is, or what the gloss means, is if you take a tree trunk like this, and you know the tree's growing out, it's got branches and such out here, you can, with either one of the branches or the trunk, you can chop that off, cut it off, has to be a very precise cut, and you can then put on another stock of a tree, another part of a tree. And by doing that, you can grow two different kinds of trees. I've got a tree at home, it's called a fruit cocktail tree. It produces plums, peaches, and apricots, or it's supposed to at least, so far it's only producing uh, plums. But it's got three different kinds of trees engrafted onto it. So when it says to graft onto, what Hamlet is saying, well, let me finish the rest of the gloss. So graft metaphorically. Um, For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. So inoculate refers to this, the grafting off, grafting of something new onto something previous or something old. And then the rest of the gloss, from but to it, that we do not, uh, excuse me, that we do not still have about us a taste of the old stock, i.e. retain our sinfulness. This is what we're going to spend a few minutes on. Virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. Okay? Virtue. What does he mean by virtue? Later on, act, towards the end of act three, Hamlet's going to tell her mo his mother to assume a virtue even if you don't have one. And what he means by that is pretend to be virtuous even though you're not. Pretend to be a saint even though you're a sinner. All right? And in, the, in that specific context, what he's going to tell her to do is stop sleeping with your husband, who is also her dead husband's brother, because that's incest. So he says... Stop doing that. The first night will be hard, but the second night will be just a little bit easier. You keep doing that. If you keep assuming, pretending to be virtuous, you will eventually become virtuous. It becomes a habit. How do you break a bad habit? You stop. Doesn't mean it's easy. You stop smoking by stopping the first cigarette. You stop drinking by the first drink. Or, how do you create a new habit? Uh, back when I was early, I've always been a runner, but when I started training for a marathon, a lot read all kinds of stuff, and one of the things was, you know, in order to train for long runs, you gotta do long runs. You don't go out the first day that you decide to run a marathon and run 26.2 miles. You do what you can, and you gradually build up. You build up the endurance, you build up the virtue, so to speak. So, virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock. Old stock. What he's talking about there is our old nature. You, you have to presume for a moment, uh, I'm going to presume for a moment for the purpose of this discussion, everybody in the Christian and understands a little bit. We, Sorry. I left the phone in the graduate office. Uh, who? Uh, graduate office? Thank yep. You. Um, so you have to assume that for the purpose of this discussion. So what that means is everyone is born according to, where is he? 
St. Augustine, 5th century, St. Augustine, a bishop of North Africa, came up with this idea. He's the one who invented the phrase, and the, really the idea behind it, of original sin. And what he meant by that is everyone after Adam and Eve are born sinful. Okay? That is, we have it in our DNA. Sin, according to Augustine, is passed on through sex. That's it. It's not passed on by talking. I mean, yeah, you can lie to people, all that kind of stuff. But it's not passed on, okay? So it's passed on via sex, all right? This was not the universal view of the church at that time. I mean, it was his idea. It gradually spread, relatively quickly, actually, to where this became the dominant idea about humanity's sinful nature in all of what's called the Western Church. Essentially, all of the Roman Catholic Church and all of the Protestant Church, because the Protestant Church comes out of Roman Catholicism, right? The Eastern Church, that is the early church in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, now called the Orthodox Church, never adopted this idea. Never. It adopted the language ancestral sin, meaning the sin of the first ancestors, Adam and Eve. Okay? Original sin, as I said, means we're all guilty of sin from the moment we're born. The medieval Catholic view was if you have a child and the baby dies before it is baptized, that baby goes to hell. Not fire and brimstone hell, but just blah land. Murfreesboro in mid-August, hell, right? Not the current pope, the one before that. Benedict, 16th, I think pretty sure it was Benedict, said, because from the medieval period up into the 20th century, that idea was modified so that babies were no longer in hell, they were in limbo, an in-between place. Not a place of suffering, but also not a place of joy not a paradise. Benedict said BS. He did away with it. He had that authority as Pope. Said there is no limbo. Babies born unbaptized are immediately in heaven. All right? Not the idea in Shakespeare's day. Okay? Why? Because everyone is born with this old nature this original sin in their nature. I made a reference to the Eastern Church um, earlier, just to give you an idea of the, the difference between the two. The idea of the ancestral sin is that Adam and Eve uh, made a bad decision, sin, okay? And what that did is it didn't pass on sin to their heirs. That is, people weren't born in sin, but they were born in a world touched by sin. They were born in a world that is diseased. Notice the word, the way I use that. Diseased. A world not at ease. A world in pain, in other words. A world in trouble, a world in conflict. Okay? And because being born into that situation, everyone is likely to sin. Because we're born into a sinful state, a world, in other words, that way. All right? Huge difference between those two. So, part of Augustine's idea here, therefore, is because everybody is born this way, obviously no one can fix themselves. That's Christian idea of why Jesus has to come, all that kind of stuff. All right? So that, that original sin, that's the old stock when he says... Virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock. It can't fix that broken part, that original sin in us. So what does it mean by virtue? Good deeds. Good deeds. Good actions. 
helping a little old lady across the road. That's a good deed. He says, that won't do it. Why? There's not enough good deed you can do because you're still touched by this. Okay, so, so this is Catholic idea largely. Let me switch for a moment from the Catholic idea to the Protestant idea. Simply because I said at the outset of talking about Hamlet, Hamlet Shakespeare is probably his most religious play, and we see this tension, this conflict between Protestant Christianity on one hand and Catholic Christianity on the other hand. Okay? So why can't good deeds take care of this? Okay? The medieval Catholic Church, let me back up before I talk about this, because I'm going to connect good deeds with this. The medieval Catholic Church actually did say, I misspoke earlier when I said you couldn't wipe out, um, you couldn't inoculate the old sock with good deeds. The medieval Catholic Church said that ultimately you can, okay? Remember, I think I had on the board the other day, heaven, purgatory, hell, and I said, if you go here, you stay here. There's just no getting out of hell. If you go to purgatory, eventually you will make it to heaven. It may take a billion years, but eventually you get there. If you go to heaven, you're, you're safe. You don't go to purgatory at all, okay? <clears throat> well, there's a couple ways you can skip purgatory, right? One of those that I mentioned in the speech between Hamlet and the ghost is if you die right after saying confession, you go to your priest, you say confession, and the priest prays over you the prayers of absolution. Absolution means to be washed, to be cleansed. You're cleansed of all sin. If you have a heart attack right then, boom, you're in heaven. Okay. Another way to help is if you're on your deathbed and you receive what are called last rites. Because last rites is the absolution of sin, partially at least. There's other things involved there. So those are two ways you can do that. The medieval church built up this idea, totally foreign to St. Augustine. And I, I'm going to mention the idea in just a second. Built up this idea that you can also skip purgatory by dipping into, like you dip a ladle into a pot of soup, by dipping into this divine bank account. And the bank account, so to speak, is the savings account of merit earned by all the good deeds done by the saints over the years. That is, when somebody does, does a good deed, it's like, you know, you drop a penny in a bank account. And you do a lot of good deeds, and more pennies get dropped into that account, so to speak. One person did only good in his life. Jesus. Jesus, so to speak, topped off that account. That account never runs out. It's always full because of the good actions of Christ, dying to save the world, that kind of thing, all right? So the Catholic, medieval Catholic Church said, there's a way for us to draw on that bank account of good deeds. And that's through what are called indulgences, okay? Indulgences were issued by the Pope that enabled one to get time out of purgatory. And you got time out of purgatory because the good deeds done by previous saints got applied to your um, account that is in the red. You know, you owe. So think of the, the account as being a balance, right? You've done all these bad, bad stuff, so you're down here. All the saints, however, have done all this great stuff, and their good deeds can get applied to yours to help balance it out. When that happens, you get relieved from purgatory, all right? So how do you get indulgences?
That's how. You buy them. Okay? There's a guy named, a seller of indulgences, named Johann Tetzel, selling indulgences in Germany. And you can get indulgences for differing amounts. That is, you pay a larger amount and you get more merit of the saints applied to your account. So, let's say I buy a, an indulgence worth $5. Well, I get, you know, let's say five days out of purgatory. I buy indulgence worth $500. I get 500 days out of purgatory. The more you spend, the more you get, okay? This money went to the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. All right? So that's, that's the basic idea. The problem that arose, I mean, there's all kinds of theological problems, but the problem that arose was that people were buying indulgences for sins they hadn't yet committed. So, red-blooded American male, let's say I'm a red-blooded uh, German heterosexual male, and I see a, a pretty young Fraulein walking down the street, and I think, man, she's hot. I'm going to rape her. You could go buy an indulgence for that sin before you've done it. I love the look on your face because it's like, what the hell is wrong with these people? Okay? An Augustinian monk named Augustinian because the order was named after St. Augustine. Okay. St. Augustine was a really, you know, really severe theologian. You got to know a little bit about his background to understand why. Before he became a Christian, he was the one you wanted to party with. I mean, this guy, who oh, did he know how to party? Read his confessions, and it's all about, today I slept with, and today I slept with, and his mother's praying for him all this time. She's a Christian. He's not. He comes to Jesus and throws all that Beside, but he still knows he's he's got this. He's going to deal with this, anyways. So the Augustinian monks are named after Saint Augustine. Where is he? Martin Luther. Martin Luther has this Johann Tetzel selling indulgences in his area, and Tetzel used to sing a song that said, "As soon as the coin in the coffer clinks." So money hits a metal plate, the soul from purgatory springs. Because part of the idea of indulgences was I could not only buy indulgences for myself to get myself out of purgatory, I could buy indulgences for my dear old dad who murdered somebody. Assuming for the moment he's in purgatory. Okay? That repulsed Martin Luther. Repulsed him because of two things. One, the theology of, theology of it. And two, the money was going to Italy. See, it'd been one thing if it was staying in Germany to make Germany great again, you know. But it wasn't. So that kind of sets him thinking. Well, that and a variety of other things. He went to confession one day, confessed all of his sins. He was like St. Augustine. He was a really serious dude. Went to confession, and as he was walking out of the church from confession, he sinned in his mind. And he thought, damn, I can never be clean, because as soon as I confess, I sin again. Okay? And he started to think, there's a problem. There's a problem with this whole process. He drew up 95 problems that he had with the church. They're called 95 theses. This is, this is 95 points of argumentation. Okay? And on October 31st, 1517, he nailed these to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. These were, like today, somebody puts 95 points to argue on Twitter or something like that. The church door was his social media site. Okay? And all he wanted to do was sit down 
and discuss these problems that he saw with the church. He didn't want to destroy the church. He didn't want to start the Protestant Reformation, though he did start the Protestant Reformation. He wanted to reform, to cleanse the church. Nobody would take him up on it. So these get printed. Printing press had been invented about 60 years previously. They get printed, and Luther starts writing tracts and publications, broadside, you know, tweets, as it were. They get published and sent around. Protestant Reformation starts, okay? And what that means is it breaks off from the Catholic Church. Protestant Reformation has, where is it? Essentially, a single motto. The motto has three parts to it. Sola fides, that is, this is something pretty much all Protestants believe. Back to Luther's day, up to today. Sola fides, faith alone. All you need is faith in Jesus to be saved. Sola scriptura, scripture alone. All you need is the Bible to figure out enough to have faith in Jesus. And sola gratia, grace alone. All you need is the grace of God to enable you to read the scripture and develop faith. That's it. You don't need anything else, meaning you don't need a church, you don't need a priest, you don't need specific rites like communion and last rites, okay? And you don't need to do good works because good works don't do anything for you. And they pull out what are called proof texts of scripture. Everything done by man, God says, is rotten in my eyes. You know, There is no one good, none, not one. We talked about that with a good man is hard to find. Okay? That's the general motto of all Protestants. Okay? Luther starts what's now called the Lutheran Church. Another reformer, just a few years after Luther, named John Calvin, founder of what's called Calvinism, Presbyterian Church is a branch of the Calvinistic Church, okay? Calvin writes this big, long book, two volumes, actually, about what he calls the Institutes of the Christian Religion, that is, the doctrines of the church. It can, it can be summarized, okay? This is an oversimplification, but it still works. I used to be a dyed-in-the-wool Calvinist. Now I'm an Orthodox Christian. I pray to saints and all that stuff. Can be um, summed up with this acronym, TULIP. The T stands for total depravity. That's St. Augustine's original sin. All right? This is often misconstrued to mean we are all of us just horribly rotten. There's just nothing whatsoever good about us. That's not what Calvin meant. Calvin meant no matter what we do, Every good deed is tainted by sin. Here's how. You help a little old woman across the street. You think, well, this is a good deed. I'm helping her. And then what do you think? Well, it's pretty good of me to do that. See, you just canceled out that good deed because you thought of self. You thought of your ego. Pride. <laughs> Gone. And no matter what good deed you do, there's that element to it, okay? So, total depravity, that's what that means. You, unconditional election. God chooses who will be saved, period. God elects those who will be saved. You have no choice in that matter. And according to the stringent, the, the most severe form of Calvinism, because there's, there's some leeway, that would be like saying, see, in a class of this size, saved, and the rest go to hell. Because according to general even Calvinism, the vast majority of humanity is not saved. It goes straight to hell. Why? Because of the limited atonement. Jesus did not die on the cross for everyone, notwithstanding what the New Testament says about Christ died for all. It doesn't really mean that. It really means he died for all of the elect. He only died for those who were already chosen. I, irresistible grace. If God chooses you, 
you can't resist it. It's like God flip the on switch on you and you go and you worship God. Okay? Very robotic in that sense. Again, I used to believe this stuff hook, line, and sinker. P, perseverance of the saints. If you have received irresistible grace, if Christ died for you because you were among the elect, which you needed because of your total depravity, then you would persevere in your faith until your death. Okay? No matter what. So, to use an example of a popular religious figure who died in, within the last several years, Billy Graham. Most people left and right, except for the wacko leftists, would say, you know, Billy Graham was a good guy. He lived a decent life. But if Billy Graham on his deathbed had said, it's all a lie. I wasted my life. F you, Jesus. Then a good Calvinist would say, huh? he didn't show perseverance of the saints. That shows he wasn't one of the elect. He never received grace. Jesus didn't die for him. He's damned. Okay? That's general Calvinism in a nutshell. This and this are contra the Catholic belief system. Okay? Because medieval church put an overemphasis on good works that you could achieve salvation through your good works, okay? A lot of Protestants, eh, not a lot. Martin Luther hated, I mean despised, the book of James in the New Testament for one reason. He called it a book of straw, okay? James is all about, in the James there's James, the brother of Jesus, the son of Joseph, right? <clears throat> James said, faith without works is dead, period. If you don't have works, you don't have faith. He said, you say, you know, we're saved by faith alone? He goes, you're right. Show me your faith without works. What's he mean? You can't say you believe in God and not show it, demonstrate it, act it out. Okay? That's his whole point. If all you say is, I believe, I believe, I believe, and you rob from other people and you treat them like dirt, you don't really believe. Okay? That's his point. So, what does all this have to do with these lines? These lines say, virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. Good deeds cannot so graft onto the new Adam. What's the new Adam? Christ's nature. Supposedly when one becomes a Christian, one gets baptized and receives the Holy Spirit, nature of God, and changes. He's saying good deeds can't wipe out this. Okay? But we shall relish, what does he mean we shall relish of it? That of it is of the old stock. Remember the minister's black veil? What does the minister say everybody tries to do? He says everybody wears a black veil. And the black veil partially symbolizes, symbolizes a lot of different things. What? That you try to keep something hidden from God. What? Oh. I try to be an upright, quote-unquote, Christian, you know, seven days, however many hours of the week there are, except for, here's this one thing, this is mine. You can't have it, God. That's relishing of some, to use the language of that story, secret sin. Because you still enjoy it. You don't want to give it up. All right? No matter how good you behave, you cannot. He's saying, wipe this out. Okay. So we go on. I loved you not. Okay. He just said, I did love you once. She says, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me. And then he does the passage about 
virtue in the old stock. I loved you not. What is he implying? He's implying exactly what her father told him. Told her. Family doesn't love you. He just wants to have sex. That's it. He's implying. I'm not saying he's stating it. Okay? I was the more deceived. Why? What's she telling us? She believed him. How far? She loved him too. I was the more deceived. She means I was entirely deceived. You tricked me, Hamlet. Get thee to a nunnery. Why? What's going to happen if she goes to a nunnery? Remember the, the possibility for uh, Hermia? You either die, you marry Demetrius, or you go to a convent for the those who pray to Diana, the goddess of chastity and virginity. Get thee to an nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? And we're back there. Because everyone who breeds, breeds sinners. I mean, it'd be like me going home when my kids were all little and go, hello there, eldest sinner, and next eldest, and next and youngest sinner. Just name them sinner, one, two, three, four. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent honest. The gloss tells you. Indifferent honest. Moderately virtuous. Yet earlier in this speech, the gloss is defined honest, or they glossed the word honest as being what? Chaste. How can you be indifferently chaste? That is, moderately chaste. The same way you can be moderately pregnant. Are or you aren't. See, chastity has nothing to do with sex within marriage. You can have as much sex as you want within marriage. That's totally chaste. It's outside. Okay, in Shakespeare's day, within the world of the play, that it's not. You have sex once outside marriage, you're not chaste then, and you're never chaste afterwards. Meaning sexually pure. Okay? So he says, I, you know, I'm moderately chaste. I don't sleep with everything that moves, but, you know, 75%. But yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. Wow. It would be better if I had never been born. And then we have a colon. The things he could accuse himself of, he lists. I am very proud. Pride, Catholic tradition, is the chief sin. It's the sin from which all the other sins flow. Okay? Revengeful, yeah, there's a reason for that. Ambitious, notice, the ghost has charged him with revenge. His two friends have charged him with being ambitious. With more offenses at my back that is at my memory or at my call than I have thoughts to put them in. He's saying, I am totally depraved. We get a mishmash. We get a, a mixture of Calvin, or Protestant and Catholic ideas in this passage. Imagination to give them shape or time to act them. I don't have enough time to be alive to what? To act out all my sinfulness. That's hearkening more towards what I said was the popular misconstrual of this. I'm so rotten. Okay. What should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? What, why does he say crawling? Remember um, the riddle of the Sphinx? What goes on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, three legs in the afternoon, uh, three legs in the evening? It's a man, baby, adult, 
crawly, and we get the language of humanity as being beast-like, <clears throat> well, Hamlet's going to talk about humans crawling. We are errant knaves. Errant means wandering. Have we've lost our direction? Knaves. It's like low lives. All. All of us. Believe none of us. Who are the all of us and who are the none of us? What should such fellows? What do you mean by fellows? Men, not you. Men are errant knaves, all of us. Believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's thy father? So what does he mean when he says believe none of us? Think of that word, think of that phrase, literally. Believe none of us. So who should she believe? No one, right? Well, who's included in that? And what is included in that? Literally speaking, logically speaking, philosophically speaking, if you say, don't believe anything any man says to you, then what does that statement include? Also, don't believe what I've just said. Believe none of us. Hamlet might be suggesting to Ophelia, don't believe a word I'm telling you. And if that is what he means, then what is she supposed to take from this conversation with him? Is this a reverse psychology thing where I'm supposed to believe the opposite? So when he says, I did once, I never did, I never did, I never did love you, is it the opposite? Go that way to a nunnery. That is, leave male companionship. You know, I don't know why some people show up. Anyways, where's your father? Why does he ask her where her father is? Well, her father is a fellow, and he's included in that errant knaves. But why does he ask her where her father is? Within the context of the scene between himself and Ophelia, that question makes no sense. But in the context of the larger scene, beginning at the beginning of Act 3, it makes perfectly good sense. Why is Hamlet where he is at this moment? I'm, literally, why is he in this room at this moment? Because the king said he was secretly sent for. We don't know what that means. Does that mean somebody spread the word to Hamlet? You're wanted in whatever this room is, but not told by whom? Or for what purpose? It, that's probably it. So you get told, you get told, go to such and such a place. You're wanted. And you go there, and there's nobody there. What do you think? What's going on? And probably even before you go there, you think, why? Your mind is, mm, your, your mind is on edge. Your antennae are up. You're kind of, What's going on? Where's your father? At home, my lord. True or false? It's false. What has Ophelia just done? She lied to him. First time. From what we know, first time in the play. Now, you could say that earlier when she forbid Hamlet to come into her room anymore, or she did not have any conversations with him, that she was lying to him. And in a sense, she was, because she just told us she was the more deceived by Hamlet's protestations of unlove, because she did love him. Okay? 
but I'm still, why does he ask, where's your father? I think that is Hamlet's giveaway to the audience. I know exactly what is going on here. See, I, my own feeling. When Hamlet walks out onto the stage, into the room, he sees Ophelia. He knows the jig is up. He knows he's been sent for. So he asks, where's your father? She says, at home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. What has he just done? Polonius, watch yourself. I don't think Hamlet says that to Ophelia. I mean, yes, literally, surface level, he does. I think he's saying it because he knows Polonius is watching. Okay? What did Polonius and the king agree to do? They will array themselves so that they can see and hear everything. Again, if they are totally off the stage, they can't do that. Farewell. Oh, help him. You sweet heavens. She's praying to God there. Help Hamlet. Why? She thinks he's, he's totally lost. If thou dost marry, so he's assuming for the moment, she's not going to go to a nunnery. If you marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. So your dowry, usually given by the father, the dowry is the gift you bring to the wedding, to the marriage. A pocket of, uh, you know, large amount of money. Hopefully. Didn't get that. All right? So what's he going to give her for her dowry? A plague. And he gives her his plague. He means an anti-blessing. The thing in place of a blessing. Not the opposite. Okay, this is taking the place of the blessing. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. As chaste as ice. We have a word for that today. Frigid. She won't sleep with her husband. If you are as chaste, that is, as pure as as the wind-driven snow. Who wants to have sex with snow? It's cold. <laughs> it's not a pleasant thing. He says, no matter how chaste and virtuous you are, you will not escape calumny. Calumny, you don't ever go for that. Blame. Censuring. People speaking ill of you. Get thee to a nunnery. Go. Farewell. Like, move now. Or if thou wilt needs marry, that is, if you have to marry, why? Think of what Theseus says to Hermia. Think of your youth. Think of your blood. You know, are you sure you can turn all that off? If you that if thou wilt needs marry, if you must marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. See, earlier he talked about men as errant knaves. Don't believe any of us. Now he's talking about not just Ophelia, all women. And the idea is all women are sexually insatiable. They cannot be satisfied with one man. Therefore, they will cheat on you. Okay? It's a medieval renaissance commonplace idea. And when he talks about women will make monsters of men, the men will have metaphorical horns. That's because they've been turned into cuckolds. Their wives have cheated on them. I shouldn't even mention this, but what the hell. There's a whole branch of porn about cuckolding. About men getting their kicks, having their wives have sex with other men. Okay? Go get thee to a nunnery. And quickly. Why quickly? You know, you walk out in the sun, you might conceive, you, word's going to spread about, oh, 
heavenly power is restoring them. He said, I've done. I have heard of your paintings too. Your women. What does it mean we have paintings? He's not talking about these kinds of paintings. He's talking this kind of painting. Makeup. Cosmetics. God hath given you one face, that is the face you're born with, and you make yourselves another. That is, you try to look like something else. This is another image of the inoculating the old stock. You try to cover up what you really are. You jig, that is you dance, you amble, you lisp, that is you try to sound different than you normally sound. You nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. What's that gloss say? You excuse your wantonness on the ground of your ignorance. Wantonness. Carry thou rash wanton. Theseus says to, uh, sorry, Oberon says to Titania. And your gloss there said for wanton, headstrong creature. It's not what it means. It means you slut. You do what? You make your wantonness, your sexual looseness, your ignorance. You go, Ooh, I didn't know. I'm just an innocent little girl. Go to, I'll know more on it. That is, I'm not going to speak any more about this. It hath made me mad. Oh, and there he uses the word. I'm crazy. I'm a lunatic. I say we will have no more marriage. That is, from this moment on, there will be no more marriages. And those that are married already, all but one shall live. Those that are married now, they're all going to live, except for one. That is, one marriage will die. And your gloss tells you, who's he talking about? Claudius. Why would he say this? To Ophelia. Unless he knows he's being watched. The rest shall keep as they are, to a nunnery. Go! And he leaves. And Ophelia gives us this speech. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. The courtier, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion, and this mold of form, the observed of all observers. Quite, quite down. So what does she mean? What a noble mind is here overthrown, destroyed. And then she gives courtier, soldier, scholars, eye, tongue, sword. That is, he's the courtier's eye, tongue, sword. He's the soldier's eye, tongue, sword. He's the scholar's eye, tongue, sword. That is, he is the embodiment of everything the courtier, the soldier, and the scholar wants to be. The glass of fashion, that is the mirror. People used to look at Hamlet as to how to dress. And the mold of form, that is the mold of the perfect form of a man. I usually say ladies, but there's only one in here. You know, pick your ideal Hollywood actor as your ideal man. That's what she's saying Hamlet is. He's the the man, the very shape of a man, then even all men go, you know, it's just not fair that this guy has all this. The observed of all observers. What does that mean? It's like Hamlet lives in a fishbowl. But the fishbowl, he's the fish, and everybody looks inside at it, but that's not only it. She's saying, Everybody in Denmark does what? Or at the very least, everybody in Elsinore. They're doing what? What are you doing over there? What are you doing over there? They're all looking at everybody else. None of them is paying attention to his or her own problems. 
quite, quite down. And I, of ladies most deject and wretched. Why is she, of all the ladies, most deject and wretched? That sucked the honey of his music vows. Remember when she handed him the papers back? And she said, They were composed of words so breath, uh, words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich. Their perfume lost. Take these again, for to the noble mind rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. What did she mean when she said that? When I first received these, she said, oh, it was like, she wasn't saying they literally smelled good. Oh, the words, the meaning behind the words made her feel so good. But now she's saying the words have no meaning. Why? Because she thought one thing when they were given to her, but now she thinks something else. What's the something else? She told her father that first scene where we see Ophelia and Polonius together. He had given such tenders of his affection with almost all the holy vows of heaven. And what did Polonius say? Those are traps. Those are just traps to catch you. He just wants to get in your bed. So that now she thinks what? Hamlet wasn't honest. He wasn't sincere when he first gave her those letters. So she says, she sucked the honey of those vows. It was sweetness at once, or at one time. Now, see, that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells, jangled out of time and harsh. Interesting that she uses the phrase out of time. Because Hamlet said, after speaking with the ghost, and then speaking with Horatio and the others, the time is out of joint. <laughs> oh, alas, that I, what wretched spite that I was born to make it right. <clears throat> that unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. Ecstasy. His mind has left his body. Oh, woe is me. To have seen what I have seen, what is it she has seen? Hamlet in all his glory. Hamlet in his expressions of love for her. To see what I see. And now to see Hamlet like this. Okay? Question. So she's still there. King and Polonius come in. Question. What did Hamlet's, what effect did Hamlet's speech have on Ophelia? Later in the play, Ophelia dies. I'll give it away. <clears throat> There's question as to whether she just dies accidentally or kills herself, drowns herself. Derek Jacoby, one of the greatest English actors, still alive, I believe, um, I found an old interview with him. I'll post it in case you're interested. Talked in this interview about playing Hamlet, and he brought something up that I'd never seen anybody else bring up, except for me in my classes. And that's that this isn't a that the to be or not to be was not a soliloquy. He's the only other person I've seen who said that. It's everybody says. It's the greatest soliloquy in, English, in the English language. And he brings it up in the context of Hamlet knows Ophelia's on the stage, and he, he Derek Jacoby, wonders, is Hamlet the one who puts the idea of suicide into Ophelia's mind? In reading it that way, then when she dies, it is an act of suicide. Polonius and the king come in. 
king. Love, his affections do not that way tend. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. What has he just told us? That was not a soliloquy. He saw the whole thing. He saw everything Hamlet said, and then he saw all of the conversation with Ophelia, or heard it. There's something in a soul, or which is melancholy, sits on brood. So his melancholy is like a hen sitting on a clutch of eggs. And I do doubt that. That is, I don't want to be around whenever that melancholy is brooding over erupts, hatches. The hatch and the disclose will be some danger. For which to prevent, I've decided I'm going to send Hamlet to England for the demand of our neglected tribute. That is, I'm sending Hamlet to England to receive the tribute, the money, that England owes to us. See, the original Ambleth that I mentioned, the source behind all of this, probably occurs during the Viking period, when England was ruled, partly at least, by a, a Viking king, okay? Happily, the seas and countries different with variable objects shall expel this seething, something settled matter in his heart. Ron, his brain still beating, puts him thus from fashion of himself. What do you think, Polonius? So what, what does he mean by, you know, what will be the good of sending Hamlet to England? I had a student email me last night. Me and a couple other professors saying, I'm not going to be in class tomorrow. I feel dead. I just, everything just sucks. I'm just not going to show up. I replied this morning and said, not a problem. Go outside. Get in the sunlight. Go for a walk in the woods. Go walk down the greenway. Why? To get him away from this thinking about class. Get out in nature. There are all kinds of studies. People who get outside in nature, they quote unquote recenter them. They find new meaning and such. Okay? He's saying, if we get Hamlet away from Elsinore, away from the castle, away from all this stuff, it'll be a chance to recharge his batteries, you know? Spring break, so to speak. Polonius, I think that's a good idea. But I still think that the origin and commencement of his grief is sprung from neglected love. Now, I feel he's tied into this. How now, Ophelia? You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. Not a soliloquy, then. And if it's not a soliloquy, then everything from to be or not to be to the end of that speech is not Hamlet's heartfelt thoughts. It's an act. He's putting on an antic disposition. And everything he says to Ophelia springs from that antic disposition act, okay? King says, uh, Polonius goes on. My lord, do as you please. He says, but after that play, let the queen mother entreat him to come to her room. He says, and I'll be placed, as long as it pleases you, in the ear of all their conference. So, let the queen call Hamlet to her private quarters, and I will hide there. What did Hamlet say to Ophelia about her father? Tell him to stay in his own house. Let the doors be shut upon him, that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. And now Polonius is saying he's going to do what? He's going to spy on a mother and her son. King, yeah, okay, that's cool, go ahead. Why? Madness and great ones must not unwatched go. What does he mean in great ones? 
those who have great power, those who have great influence. What is Hamlet next in line to? The throne. What is, else is Shakespeare saying? Shakespeare is saying, when powerful people go mad, you got to be careful. You got to watch out. Okay? Scene two. Hamlet comes in with some of the players. Okay? We're gonna, not going to talk about it much. But the scene's important because it is almost always read. As when Hamlet tells the players how to act and how to recite his lines that he's going to give them. That this is Shakespeare telling his colleagues, guys, quit butchering my plays with all your wild gesticulating of your hands. Just speak the lines as I told you. Okay? Because bear in mind, Shakespeare not only wrote plays for the Lord Chamberlain's men and then later the King's men, he acted in those plays also. And it's like, you're overdoing it. Okay? So, Horatio comes in and speaks to Hamlet, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern come in, the king and queen come in, and Ophelia comes in. The queen says, line 94, come hither, Hamlet, come sit by me. Hamlet, no good mother, here's metal more attractive. And he points to Ophelia. Metal, more attractive, like a magnet attracting it. He's saying, no, I'm, I'm attracted, drawn to her. Polonius, see, told you, it's my daughter. Hamlet asks Ophelia, lady, shall I lie in your lap? And we get a stage direction, lying down at Ophelia's feet. But lady, shall I lie in your lap, implies what? Shall I lie in your middle? Remember Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Faith, her privates, we, talking about their relationship with fortune, so to speak. And Hamlet calls her a strumpet, then is a whore or slut. Shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. Hamlet, I, I mean my head upon your lap. I don't mean having sex right here. My head upon your lap. There's a problem with that, too. Okay? I, my lord, that is, I know what you mean. Or is she now saying, no, it's okay, put your head in my lap. Head, by the way, had both its sexual connotation, not only today, it had that same thing, a male's penis, in Shakespeare's day. Hamlet asked, do you think I'm in country matters? Okay, and you've got a gloss with a body pun. I worked for a number of years as an assistant editor on what's called the big long name, the very Orem edition of the poetry of John Donne. John Donne was a contemporary of Shakespeare's. John Donne loves to pun on sex, just like Shakespeare does, okay? And in one of Donne's poem, one of Donne's poems, he has um, the phrase, I think it's the exact same phrase, country matters. And in many of the manuscripts, the word country is spelled C-U-N-T-R-Y. Not because of this word pronunciation. Why do we spell this? Makes no sense. Okay? But when a scribe would copy could we know that there are copies of the poems that have this, and we can trace from one manuscript to another. And we see this become this in some manuscripts. And it's pretty clear there that's because the scribe wants to make obvious the sexual pun. Do you think I'm in country matters? And she says, I think nothing, my lord. I'm just a big airhead. I don't know what to think. The only problem with that understanding is that this is related, partially at least, to that. 
how do you represent nothing? Let's say numerically. It's an O. Or another way of calling it, it's a whole. Okay. Like I said, if, there, if Shakespeare if Shakespeare can pun something, and if he can pun sexually on something, he will every time. And there's good reason for that. Think of his audience. You've got the groundlings down there in the straw, the people with very little education who like dirty humor, as well as the intellectuals sitting up in the galleries who like verbal punning. So just raw sexual humor in verbal way. Oh, look at that. That was quite a good one, that was. you know. So I think nothing, my lord, Hamlet. That's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. What's a fair thought to lie between maid legs, maid's legs? Ophelia asks. Nothing, and he makes the pun explicit. The O between the legs, the whole. You are merry, my lord. In other words, what's happened? Last time I saw you, Hamlet was what? Overblown, cast down, crazy as a mad hatter. Who, I, my lord? I, my lord. Okay. What should a man do but be merry? For look how my mother looks. And my father died within his two hours. Now, he's being facetious with the two hours. She says, nay, tis twice two months. Twice two months. That means it's four months. How long has it been? Hamlet's first soliloquy, before he sees the ghost, he says it's within a month. Have five weeks gone by from the beginning of the play till now? Or is there a mix-up in the timing? Unclear. Okay. He says, really? So long? Well, then, let the devil wear blood, or I'll have a suit. Two months. Huh. And not forgotten yet. By Hamlet. Okay? So, we get the play within the play. And Hamlet tells them what the play is called. We see the king and queen play actors come in. They do a mime kind of scene. We see the king within the play get poisoned in the ear and such the king queen finds him dead um, they get the real players then come out and do their lines and we're told it's called the murder of Gonzago and Hamlet says it's an excellent play and it recounts something that really happened it's also called the mouse trap okay And we're told, line 235, the poison gets poured in the guy's ears when he's lying in his garden. And Hamlet says, his name's Gonzago. The story's excellent, written in very choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife, Ophelia. The king rises. <laughs> What? Frightened with false fire? How fares my lord? Get over the place, says Polonius. Give me some light. Away. Everybody leaves but Hamlet and Horatio. So, what does the play do to Claudius? Disturbs him. He has to get up and get out of there. Why? What did Hamlet say when he told us his little brief soliloquy? What would happen with this play within the play? He says, the place, the thing we're in, I'll catch the conscience of a king. All right? Got him. Hamlet now has what he thinks is proof that the king did what the ghost, or possible spirit, said he did. Okay? Um, skip a bit. 
Horatio leaves, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come back in. And they say, we, we, we want to have a word with you. Hamlet, you could have a whole history. Betty, you like, have just one word. Okay. The king, uh, what of him? He's in his retirement, marvelous distempered. What does that mean? He's marvelously distempered. Oh, he's pissed. He is out of sorts. That's what distempered means. With drink, that is, is he drunk? No, with choler, anger. Well, get a doctor. Um, what's wrong, Hamlet? Put your discourse into some frame and start not so wildly from my affair. Am I? I'm fine. What? The queen, your mother, has sent for you. Okay, Hamlet, thank you. This courtesy is not of the right breed. If it shall please you to make a wholesome answer, I will do your mother's commandment. That is, what do you want us to tell your mother? Okay. They keep going back and forth with Hamlet. The players come back in. One of them has a recorder, you know, like a little flute thing. Hamlet takes the recorder. And he asks Guildenstern, will you play upon this pipe? I, I, I don't know how. I pray you. I, I cannot. I beseech you. I know no touch of it, my lord. Tis as easy as lying. That is, you know how to lie. Got you. So, if you know how to lie, you should be able to do this. You govern these vintages, these holes, with your fingers and thumb. You give it breath with your mouth, and it makes beautiful music. Here, these are the... St but these cannot I command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. And Hamlet's like, draws the noose. Why look you now, how unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me, you would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. Oh, and there is much music, excellent voice in this little organ. Yet cannot you make it speak. It's blood, God's blood. By God's blood, do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me. Okay. You cannot play upon me. What's Hamlet's whole point? You can't even play this stupid little wood instrument. What makes you think you're going to be able to pry out my music? My secrets. And in what I think is probably the greatest film version that you can see of this play, it's from a 1964 production with Richard Burton, <clears throat> great theatrical actor, playing Hamlet. And it's a kind of a dress rehearsal. Okay, so it's it, not this big elaborate straight stage, he's just dressed in black. And in this scene, I mean, Burton just nails it because at the end there, Pops one of the guys on the head with the recorder. Polonius comes in. Your mother wants to see you. Hamlet says, okay. He goes off to his mother. Scene three. We've only got a few minutes, nine minutes. Rosencrantz and Kilnestern come in with the king. And the king says, I like him not. <laughs> I don't want Hamlet here any longer. It's not safe to let this madness range. So, he's gonna go to England, you're gonna take him, I'm gonna give you papers to take. They say, okay. Most holy and religious fear it is to keep those many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. Notice what that makes the king. The food for the state. Put a note in your book Act four, scene three, line 20 and following. Because Hamlet's gonna play on this same language when we get to that act scene and line, okay? Notice they're saying the, what? 
The safety of the state depends upon the safety of the king. Okay? So they say, we'll take Hamlet as you command. Polonius comes in. He tells the king, Hamlet's going to his mother's closet. I'll hide behind an heiress and spy on them. Okay? He says, before I go to bed, I'll stop by your room and tell you what I hear. The king, uh, Polonius leaves. And King Claudius gets a soliloquy. And what does he reveal? He admits to the audience, guilty. Yep, I did it. Killed my brother. My offense, he says, is rank to heaven. In other words, his conscience has gotten to him. But he asks, lines 50 and following, how can I pray? What form of prayer can serve my turn? That is, what, how can I pray to repent of this action? What does repent mean? You stop what you're doing and you go the other direction. So if he really wanted to repent of his action, what would he have to do? Unmarry Gertrude, for one thing. Give the kingdom over to Hamlet. Okay? So he says, hmm, how can I do this? Can I be pardoned and retain the offense? Indulgences? Can I buy an adult? He's not literally saying this, but these are the ideas that are tied up with that. Can I buy an indulgence and still do the sin? Hmm. He says, well, I got to try, at least in terms of prayer. Line 65, try what repentance can. That is, try, see what repentance is able to do. What can it not do? Hanging on the cross, one of the thieves says something to Jesus, and another one says something else. One says, if you're the Christ, get out off the cross and take us with you. The other one says, what the hell do you think you're doing? This man hasn't done anything yet he's being punished. We rightfully deserve what we're getting. And then he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Anybody know what Jesus says? Today you will be with me in paradise. Why? He repented with those words. Remember me in your kingdom. Okay? So, what can it when one cannot repent? O wretched state, O bosom black as death, O limed soul that's struggling to be free or more engaged. Limed means in fire, being burned. Help, angels, make a say. Bow stubborn knees. And he falls down on his knees. He clasps his hands in prayer like a good Protestant. At heart with strings of steel, be soft as sinews of the newborn babe. Because it's Christmas time. All may be well. In other words, I might be able to be saved. And so he's down there in prayer, head bowed. Hamlet walks by. He sees the king. He pulls the sword out. He says, now I can do it. I can kill him now. Why doesn't he? Because he's praying. And what do you think is going to happen to Claudius if he kills him now? He's going to go straight to heaven. And he goes, wait a second. Pause. He killed my father. My father's in purgatory, suffering. I kill him now, he goes straight to heaven. That's not vengeance. He says, that's being paid. I mean, that's a good deal. Who wouldn't want that? No, 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 no. What did Hamlet say? Thought does to the native hue of resolution. Or sicklies the face. It makes it pale. Notice it's thought. What has Hamlet just done? He's overthought the situation. How do we know? Because Hamlet leaves, and what does the king do? My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. What do you mean by thoughts? My innermost feeling. Words. 
kind of a new Adam rises up, but my thoughts, my old stock, the stuff he relishes, remain below. Why? Words without thoughts never to heaven go. In other words, in order for prayer to be efficacious, it has to be sincere. He's not sincere. Hamlet could have killed him then, and where would Claudius go? Hell. But he doesn't. Okay? We'll stop there. Uh, so we will pick up with Hamlet getting ready to go into the queen's closet. Scene four, the beginning of scene four on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. Don't forget there's a quiz due tomorrow night over, tomorrow night, right? Yeah, tomorrow night over Acts 1 and 2, if you haven't already done it.